Take a look at the white ball moving around on the screen. Pretty easy to keep focus on, especially with it moving in a straight line, isn't it? The process of eye tracking is one of the most primitive and prevalent in the animal kingdom. And given this, it is surprising how advanced and complex it actually is. When objects move up and down, the eyes must also move up and down in a coordinated fashion. But when objects move left and right, well, one eye has to abduct while the other eye adducts. The concept becomes even more impressive when considering the number of muscles that actually synergistically act to coordinate these movements. This will be the focus of the second segment on the orbit and eye. Welcome back to the second segment on the orbit of the eye. In the previous session, we looked at the general features of the orbit, and specifically of the eye itself. In the current session, we'll consider the muscles that attach in and around the eye, and take an in-depth look at their rather complex actions. There are a total of seven orbital muscles to consider, each with its own distinct action. Of these, six originate off a common tendinous ring found at the apex of the orbital fissure surrounding the optic canal. Five of the seven share a common innervation, while the remaining two are each innervated by exclusive nerves specific to these muscles. The first to discuss is levator palpebrae superioris. This muscle is unique among the seven in that it has no actual attachment to the eyeball whatsoever. Levator palpebrae superioris projects from the common fibrous ring to insert into the skin and tarsus of the superior eyelid. This skeletal muscle is one of the five innervated by the oculomotor nerve and contracts to open the eyes to take in more information. In addition, it receives sympathetic innervation that generates a forceful contraction when aroused from a relaxed state. Ever had the experience of nodding off when in a seated position, possibly while watching one of these videos? Then suddenly your head bobs forward and it snaps you awake with your eyes wide open. Well, the eye part is a sympathetic response through levator palpebrae superioris. Individuals who suffer damage to their sympathetic chain, a condition known as Horner syndrome, will present with permanent drooping of the eyelid, which is referred to as ptosis. Next on the list is the superior rectus. This muscle will insert onto the superior aspect of the sclera and contracts to elevate the pupil. As we'll see in a few minutes, it can also adduct and inwardly rotate the eye, but we'll get to that. Opposite the superior rectus, the inferior rectus inserts on the inferior surface of the eye. As you might expect, this muscle is antagonistic to the superior rectus and serves to depress the pupil. We'll also see in a few minutes that it can assist the superior rectus in adducting the pupil but is again antagonistic in externally rotating the eye. Next up is the medial rectus muscle. In this case, the muscle inserts on the medial aspect of the sclera and is purely an adductor of the eye. The last of the four rectus muscles is the lateral rectus. Attaching opposite the medial rectus muscle, it is a pure abductor of the eye. This is also the first muscle on our list that is not innervated by the oculomotor nerve. In this case, the abducens nerve is responsible for the innervation. The other muscle on the list with a unique innervation is the superior oblique muscle. Another unique feature is its angle of insertion. Like all the other muscles we've discussed so far, the superior oblique originates off the fibrous ring surrounding the optic canal and travels anteriorly and lateral to the superior rectus. But instead of attaching directly to the eye, the muscle tendon wraps around a sling on the superomedial wall of the orbit known as the trochlea. From here, it projects back on the superior surface of the eye. As a result, its principal function is inward rotation of the eye, but the angle of pull also means that the muscle is pulling forward on the superior surface of the eye directing it towards the trochlea. As a result, the superior oblique also serves to depress the eyeball. The final muscle on the list is the inferior oblique. 
Unlike the first six muscles discussed, the inferior oblique originates off the medial floor of the orbit. It then wraps along the underside of the eye to attach to its infralateral surface. The principal function of this muscle is outward rotation of the eye, but once again, because of the line of pull, it draws the inferior margin of the eye forward, resulting in elevation of the eye. Together, the orbital muscles work in synergy to produce all of the necessary motions for movement of the eyes involved in tracking and focusing. The movements of the eyes are extremely complex. To assist with their interpretation, it's helpful to break the motions down into three fundamental planes of reference. Rotations around the vertical axis, shown here in red, generate abduction and adduction. This is the principal function of the medial and lateral rectus muscles. Movements along the transverse axis, shown here in green, result in elevation and depression of the pupil. The superior and inferior rectus muscles are the prime movers along this axis. Probably the most confusing is movement along the anteroposterior axis. It's not something we really think about, but any time that we bend our head to the side, the eyes will rotate in place to help maintain our perspective of upright posture. Part of the reason that the characters on television seem right side up, even when we're watching TV while lying on our side. To demonstrate, consider this image of a woman with clock faces placed over her eyes. In the upright position, the clocks are positioned normally, with the 12 at the top. As we turn the head to the side, the clock faces also turn, so that the 10 or 11 are now the highest numbers. The body prefers the eyes to be upright, and so muscle contractions will rotate the eyes to get the 12 back to the top position. For the eye on the side we are bending our head towards, the upper portion rotates towards the nose to keep the top portion at 12 o'clock. This is referred to as intorsion. For the eye on the other side of the face, the upper portion must rotate away from the bridge of the nose for the top of the eye to stay at a 12 o'clock position. This is referred to as extorsion. If the head were bent to the other side, the principles remain the same. The eye on the side we are bending towards intorts, while the other eye extorts. These movements are challenging to conceptualize in part because the eyes are completely symmetrical around the anteroposterior axis, which makes them difficult to observe directly. Time to put the pieces together in order to figure out how these muscles work together. Let's start with the superior rectus and inferior oblique muscles. As previously stated, the superior rectus pulls back on the top part of the eye, while the inferior oblique pulls forward on the bottom part of the eye. Combined, both of the movements will generate elevation of the eye. But if we look at the vertical axis, we notice that both muscles lie to the medial side of the axis. This means that while the superior rectus pulls backward to generate adduction of the eye, the inferior rectus pulls forward to generate abduction of the eye. A similar phenomenon is seen along the anteroposterior axis, with the superior rectus trying to intort and the inferior rectus trying to extort the eye. So while these muscles will both contribute to elevation, their other motions cancel each other out. A similar phenomenon is seen with the inferior rectus and superior oblique. In this case, the inferior rectus pulls back on the inferior portion of the eye while the superior oblique pulls forward on the superior portion of the eye. So along the horizontal axis, both muscles contribute to depression of the pupil. Once again though, both muscles attach on the same side of both the vertical and anteroposterior axis, but pull in different directions. They therefore cancel each other out with abduction, adduction, and intorsion, extorsion. With these concepts in mind, we can map a vector diagram to the eye, which predicts the muscles which will combine to generate certain motions. For example, the lateral rectus, inferior oblique, and superior oblique will all combine together to generate abduction of the eye, 
with a precise balance between the inferior and superior oblique to regulate pupillary elevation and depression. It's just important to remember that the actions of one eye are mirrored by the other eye. If we're talking about elevation and depression, the pupils must move together. Movements in the other planes, on the other hand, differ between the two sides of the face. When one pupil is abducted, the other must necessarily be adducted to maintain normal gaze. This requires recruitment of a very different set of muscles when comparing one eye to the other. Another issue to consider is with how movements of the eye will change the line of pull for the different ocular muscles. We can explain this concept with rubber bands attached to a rotating disc. Notice that in a neutral position, the two large bands attached on opposite sides of the axis of rotation. If a band passes to the left of the axis of rotation, as shown with this free band, it generates a counterclockwise force. But if it passes to the right of the axis of rotation, it generates a clockwise force. Note, however, that as the line of pull approaches the axis of rotation, there is less torque generated. And if the band passes directly through the axis, there is no rotation produced at all. Now let's imagine for a moment that we are looking down on an eye. If we rotate the eye in one direction, let's say into adduction, for example, notice what happens to the position of these two bands. The one on the left will ultimately pass directly through the axis of rotation and will no longer have an influence on that specific motion. Similarly, if we rotate the disc in the other direction, we reach a point where the second band will pass over the axis of rotation and will no longer contribute to rotational force as well. Now let's consider what this means when we look to our left. In this case, the left eye is abducted while the right eye is adducted. In the case of the left eye, the superior rectus now passes directly over both the vertical and anteroposterior axes and will no longer contribute to either adduction or intorsion. This means that 100% of the force it is generating is going into elevation. In other words, when the eye is abducted, the superior rectus has its greatest influence on the elevation of the pupil. On the other hand, when we look at the right eye, the inferior oblique muscle now passes closer to or through the vertical and anteroposterior axes. This means that an adducted position is when the inferior oblique has its greatest effect on elevation of the pupil. The same concept applies with the synergistic relationship between the inferior rectus and superior oblique muscle. In the abducted position, the inferior rectus has the greatest influence on depression of the pupil. In the adducted position, the superior rectus becomes increasingly more important in contributing to pupil depression. If the last several slides left your head spinning, well, don't panic. It's a difficult concept that requires time to digest. Fortunately, it can all be summarized in the following slide. Moving the eyes in the following directions allows for testing of all the major muscles moving the eye. Abnormal eye movements in particular directions can help us identify which muscle may specifically be involved, and possibly which nerves may be affected. This leads nicely into our next discussion of the neurovascular supply to the orbit, which will be the topic of our third and final segment in our exploration of the orbit. We'll see you after the break.